What's happening, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Crash Bang Boom podcast. Today's guest is drummer Dan Wilding of Carcass. Dan and I get into the process of him becoming a member of Carcass, uh, their means of writing material, their new record, Torn Arteries, due out September 17th, the battles of acquiring double bass skills and maintaining them, as well as a whole bunch of other goodness. So I hope you all enjoy it, and hell, you might even get a lap or two in like Dan and I did throughout the entire episode. So kudos to British humor. Crash Bang Boom Podcast can be found on iTunes Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Luminary, Google Play, Podbean, and Amazon Music Podcast, to name a few. Feel free to check out any of the previous 240-plus episodes. Give me a like, a subscription, and or a positive review as the support is appreciated. Shout out to my sponsor, New Orleans Record Press. If you're looking to release some vinyl, hit them up at neworleansrecordpress.com. Check out their electroplating, mastering, design, packaging, vinyl, coloring options, and they got a real-time quote generator to keep tabs and all that. They also print 12 and 7 inch records at 150 and 180 gram variants, and they do small runs of 100 and larger runs up and do the thousands. So hit them up, and that's NewOrleansRecordPress.com. All right, without further ado, here we go. Dan Wilden. Let's do it. Carcass. Even talked about some actual carcass removal. What timing? Crash, bang, boom. Crowds go mad with joy. Yep, yep. Right, I'm here with Dan Wilding of the one and only Carcass. Dan, what's happening, man? I know you're about seven hours in front of me. I can't believe we can do this with the way technology works today. It's unbelievable. It is insane. As we were just saying, when it works, it is just the best thing ever. And it is great. I mean, I've li- I don't know what you're up to, but I've literally just put my kids down to bed. So I'm like winding down for the day. <laughs> I guess you're like right in the middle of your day, right? I, just... I just I just dropped my kids off a little while ago to daycare. So, yeah, it, my day began a few hours back. and <laughs> Literally the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had some time. I mean, yeah, it's like midday today, but whatever it's it is bizarre man and uh i was gonna tell you in a bizarre uh sequence of events uh, i don't know how much roadkill y'all have out there in the uk on your interstates roads and whatnot but <laughs> they're everywhere in the united states it's r- everywhere you go is roadkill it's deer and possum and raccoons and dogs and cats and squirrels and rabbits and all this shit shit i didn't realize that <laughs> yeah there's dead animals everywhere scattered meat it's fucking gross <laughs> And uh, I was, I always, I've never actually seen, I've never seen someone picking it up, nor have I seen a car marked for someone who would be the person that would go deal with carcasses. And (laughs) wouldn't you know it, this week when driving down the interstate, I drove past a guy in a diesel truck pulling a flatbed trailer and he had carcass removal painted on the side. And I was like, I'm interviewing the drummer of carcass. I just saw the guy, the carcass removal guy. This shit was meant to be Dan Wilding. This is fate. This is some kind of crazy seven-hour difference fate. <laughs> it's really meant to be, man. This is fucking unbelievable. That's cool, man. And yes, we don't have we. I mean, you know, you get like rabbits, but outside of rabbits, we just we don't really have roadkill over here. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a feeling that. Might you guys be have got those big vehicles, though, right? You got the big the big trucks and stuff over there. <laughs> yeah, and deer. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of deer everywhere. So there's just mm-hmm. always deer. It's uh, you see them everywhere. It's, it's, is that it's in crazy. Utah, especially where you are now? Is that kind uh, of... Yeah, but I mean, I grew up uh, in the south of Louisiana, and it was every bit as much of crazy stuff down yeah. there. In fact, even more, honestly, because then you see ar- more armadillo, possum, uh, raccoon, oh, wow. rabbits, uh, dogs, cats, deer, squirrel, That's everything. So cool. <laughs> it's It's crazy. So m- out here, it's mostly deer, and like th- that's kind of it thankfully wow i mean it's like it's super rare if you see a deer over here it's like oh my god there's a deer don't say anything you'll scare it <laughs> yeah we see them so uh we go for little rides outside of here and we'll see them in uh, in the woods and you got to be careful because they'll dart in front of you they'll dart into the side Shit. of you you gotta you gotta be careful with it. so hence hence all the dead deer everywhere but uh, this <laughs> has carcasses. been an interesting <laughs> uh way to start this drumming podcast yeah, off, by the way. There but, we go. uh, well, we're talking about carcasses i guess <laughs> absolutely it's completely apropos <laughs> Well, speaking of Carcass, man, uh, I know that uh, you've been with them for quite some time now. Uh, congrats, by the way, on Surgical Steel. What a killer record. And Thanks, uh, you have a new one coming out, Torn Arteries, I believe, September 17th, if I had my dates right. And uh, tell I me a little. I think that's right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something <laughs> like that, right? Yeah, I can't remember. Sometime, yeah. <laughs> yeah. With COVID and everything, all the del- subsequent delays, uh, how long have y'all been sitting on this record since its completion? Oh, good question. I think 
Oh yeah, so it's almost three years. It will be. Whoa! Uh, actually, actually, sorry, no, not from completion. It would be around two and a bit years from completion. But I, w- I tracked the drums six six weeks after my second son was born, and he is three in a few weeks. Wow. It's been three years for you. Yeah, it's been three <laughs> years since I did all my stuff. Yeah, which is insane. Uh-huh. And then, I mean, it took best part of a year, I think, for the whole the whole album with the mix and the master to be done because we kind of refused to stop touring and we had to do it in like in between tours uh-huh. and in between shows and all that kind of stuff. So it was a it was a very long process. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, it's been at least two at least two years, maybe more than two years. We've actually been sat on the final product with song names layout every like right. artwork all that stuff and we've just been like oh my god can we please just get this out now <laughs> yeah yeah so. well you didn't record your drums in separate sessions right no it was it was all okay it was all one i mean because we released that uh a dis- the ep called despicable i think that was last year uh-huh i think i can't remember but <laughs> yeah. um and that was the same all the same session so i did you know as most bands do i did i did all my drums first yep and then that took about two a uh, week and a half i think mm-hmm. and then we had some we had a sh- tour shows whatever exactly. and then we came back again did guitars and then went away again then came back and did bass but you know so more guitars more vocals uh, more mixes more exactly yeah. exact overdubs of all kinds of oh, crazy yeah. shit that's yeah so it's <laughs> it was a long process and i think it probably was a good thing because i think having that space like we would do something and then we'd have some space yeah uh, and we'd be in a completely different mindset and then we'd come back and we'd re-listen and we'd be like actually this bit's really cool or we'd be like this bit sucks let's let's me- totally. let's mess around with this you know so and the drums obviously didn't change because you can't really mess around with that too much when it's done but the the guitars changed quite a bit the vocals were moved sure. around there's a lot of production stuff that was added and i think that probably wouldn't have happened if we just did it in one block absolutely because we would have you know we wouldn't have had that distance and you know we would have just been so bored we would just let's just get it done you know? <laughs> so so I think it was a good thing. Yeah, it's like when you eat sushi and you put ginger in your mouth to like cleanse your palate, eat the next round of sushi. <laughs> exactly. I call it like audible ginger. You can actually <laughs> like uh, or sonic ginger. You actually have the the perspective of like some objectivity because you've separated yourself from it. So yeah, Ex- exactly. I like that, man. I like that. Yeah, that makes still sense. <laughs> sonic ginger, the name of my next project. <laughs> And we'll all wear red wigs and red beards. We'll just be a bunch of gingers. It'd be great. We'll tie yeah, all, all in. band. Yeah, yeah, ginger <laughs> grindcore band. Sonic ginger. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I love it. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. That. Uh, well, tell me about the process. I guess of even getting those songs together. So, I mean, if you recorded all the drums up front, which is the way it generally works, then you all had all the songs at least mapped out from your perspective. So what was the process prior to even recording the drums of y'all getting all of that stuff together? Was that a pretty lengthy process? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, Surgical Steel was, uh, when was it? Eight, I think it was eight years ago. Yeah. Funnily enough, we figured out the other day that it, I think it came out on the 19th of September, 2013. And this is oh, coming wow, out 17th. 17th of September, 2021. So it's... Uh, Damn. Yeah, so it's eight years almost exactly, which is, you know, fucking ridiculous. But Wow. <laughs> it was the way they write is because, I mean, I've been in a load of other projects pre-Carcass. Sure. And I've done some stuff whilst I've been in Carcass as well. And you, I'm sure, you know, most, especially metal bands these days, they kind of program drums. There's kind of, you know, demos that are made in a computer and then everybody kind of learns it. And then, you you know, you figure it out that way. And, yep. you know, that's that's cool. That's one way of doing it. But carcass is super old school it is just it's get in a room bill the guitar player he has a riff and he's like right i got this riff um what what do you think should what drums do you think we should do and i'm like well i don't know let's just you know it's and it is literally just like jamming out all the riffs that he has and trying to kind of jigsaw puzzle them together so and it's awesome because it's it's super organic and it's again it's super old school it's kind of like you do in your you know high school band yeah but it's again, it's a super lengthy process because you have to all be in a room together, and right. you know some as as you know, I'm sure like sometimes you create gold, and then you have two months where you create nothing, right? <laughs> so so you know, and that's and obviously we were touring really heavily after Surgical Steel, so it the reason it's taken so long to even write it was just because 
that process takes a lot longer than than just you know programming stuff in a computer and doing little demos like bill doesn't even know how to use you know anything on a computer he had a dictaphone and like wow he would yeah he played it with like old school tapes in he brings it he brought in his dictaphone and like he listened to remind himself of the riffs and then like he uh he recorded me and him jamming on his phone like that would be his reference point and i was like you know i can set up some microphones and he was like nah fuck that we don't need to do that let's just keep it old school so um yeah so the the process was cool it's i mean and i'm i've really gotten used to it now when i first joined the band just before surgical steel i was it was totally out of my kind of again i hadn't done that since i was a teenager with you know my kind of high school bands and and then <laughs> You know, because all the bands since were like, again, programmed drums. And, you know, I kind of had a map of the song before I even kind of started to play it. Whereas, yeah, it was just like, you know, sat down with Bill Steer and he just walks in like, cool. So I got this riff. Uh, what do you think you should play on it? Like, I have no idea, dude. Tell me what to do. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? like, <laughs> but with with this one, it was kind of because I kind of knew that's how they worked. Yeah, I was I was more prepared for it. And I think we're definitely a lot more comfortable playing together now because mm-hmm. we we hadn't played any shows before we recorded surgical steel which is wow ridiculous looking back yeah i joined the band and then around three weeks after i joined the band we started re- uh, writing surgical steel and the first shows we did were after surgical steel was recorded and mixed and everything so damn so we would never even played a show together before i write ro- before we wrote that album to- and recorded that album together so it was kind of <laughs> it was kind of trial by fire wow um yeah, so this time was so much more comfortable because we'd been, you know, touring constantly and we knew each other as people, we knew each other as musicians. And I th- I like to think you hear that more with this because when I listen to Surgical Steel now anyway, I I hear like a bunch of guys that don't really know, you know, I, maybe it's just me overthinking it, but I know Bill said the same thing as well. It's It's quite obvious that, you know, we're not uncomfortable with each other, but it doesn't feel super tight and super locked in and super kind of cohesive. And I feel like torn arteries is definitely, it's almost like, you know, old slippers, just putting on some slippers. <laughs> if it, if it, if it feel, I, I feel like maybe that's just because I feel more comfortable, but listening to it, I feel like my drum parts go better with Bill's riffs. And I feel like the vocals kind of meld better with everything because mm. yeah, I think we all understand how each other plays now and, you know, our personality types, we understand how, I think anyway, I hope that's what comes across <laughs> when people hear it. But yeah, 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 man. With recording it, where did you end up going record it? Because now both on Surgical Steel and this record, Torn Arteries, uh, and even when I, I went back and watched your uh, Drumio uh, thing that you did with Ash Pearson, and uh, oh, and yeah, I was in, cool I, I really <laughs> dug your snare sound uh, I, I, on that Drumio performance as well as both of these two records. So um, it's it's funny because you know plugins can help you with sort of getting a little room sound you know and it's getting harder and harder to tell if if like you're leaning maybe a little bit more on like the natural room sound with the room mics or if it's digitally enhanced from plugins yeah uh but i think your drum set is very has a lot of clarity but it doesn't sound overly compressed and it sounds pretty natural and again your snare is cracking and i really dig the drum sound on this record thank you Thank yeah. you, man. That's very kind. Um, I mean, and that's fully. Uh, we went to this. There's a, there's this dude called David Castillo. He's a Swedish guy. He um, he's done. What's he done? You know, Bloodbath and uh, Catatonia. Mm-hmm. Uh, Swedish band Catatonia. He's done a whole bunch of um, metal stuff. But he works with uh, Jens Bogren. Jens Bogren does like Creator and Arch Enemy and you right. know, like those guys. So he's kind of he's kind of his kind of right hand man. And he, uh, I did a session for another band and they were recording with David and, um, I just loved the way he worked so much. I loved his, the studio, like he, he was super, super into getting really good natural drum sounds. Like, Uh as you said, he wasn't, he wasn't really worried about, you know, triggers and sound replacing and plugins and all that stuff. He was really hot on trying to get as natural a sound as possible and or as good a natural sound as possible because it's incredible that especially when we were listening back to the the, like the unprocessed carcass drums it already sounded like it was kind of processed i was like shit you know when when you really know what you're doing you can make it sound you can almost make it sound like it's you know like it's yeah triggered you know right (laughs) if if you know if you really know what you're doing if you've got a good room and you you know you know how to mix well it's like you actually don't need that much or much of that processing stuff but Mm -hmm. so um yeah doing the session thing that i did 
with him i was just blown away with yeah his attitude as well like there's it's a big thing with a producer their attitude you know how how they get the performance out of you is is a big thing and you know not being i don't like people that are really pushy there's some people that i have worked with and some people that some people like that as well some people that really like fucking you know push you really hard to the point of it Nah, i don't need that yeah shit. dude i like someone who's gonna just be like yeah do what you want to do and right if it's not that good then i'll tell you but you then know, we not... can talk about it yeah you don't jump to the jump the gun over here and just be beating exactly. the shit out of me when i'm you know when i'm trying to do my thing in here it's not helping exactly like, that would never help it makes me. me just be like fuck you fuck man. you <laughs> yeah that's, that's <laughs> yeah. what you get with that you do it <laughs> fuck you <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> exactly so you yeah. totally understand yeah so uh yeah he's a super chilled guy and initially we were just going to do the drums there because um we had other plans for uh for the guitars and bass and stuff but the guys came out to when the drums were happening and and they just loved loved the whole vibe so much that we that we ended up doing the whole thing there and as far as i'm aware there is i mean there's there's definitely i'm sure there's samples and stuff in the final mix on torn arteries there's definitely stuff in there to to beef out you know sure that especially the the kick drum i'm sure and the and the snare but right it's as as natural as it as it can be without sounding kind of flat totally you know, cuz that that's the whole thing with carcass as well like there's no click tracks ever awesome everything like it was it was just me and bill in the room he was just doing like a scratch guitar um and i was playing to him and he was kind of you know so it can be quite tricky that way because David, again, the producer, he likes to do quite a few takes. Right. And without <laughs> a click track, sure, that's kind of tough because every take is slightly different yeah. tempo. So it's if you know if you're trying to if you're trying to edit or you know kind of pick bits out of different takes, it's it's really hard to do. Sometimes it's impossible because all the takes are so different. Totally. <laughs> totally. So it's you know it's it kind of pushes you to really try and make have one full take. Right. Um, which is, again, which is quite, I don't know if it's that rare, but from my experience in the studio with modern metal bands, it is quite rare. Like, you know, you do like a section and then you stop and then you do the next section and then you stop Ugh. and then then it all gets pieced together. And it's kind of like, yeah, you know, it's it makes it sound quite, quite perfect, but it loses that life, you know, and I it think, sounds a little unnatural and in, in doing. Yeah. So. And it's, you know, it's, it sounds like, uh, yeah, it sounds like it could be anybody. I think it removes, it removes, a, it removes a lot of the soul and the life of the player when you do it that way. Whereas, totally. yeah, kind of doing it with no click track, just, you know, me and Bill in a room, it was, it was, yeah, it was, it's kind of, it may, it puts the pressure on a bit more too. You're like, fuck, I really need to be good. And, right. you know, I, I need, I, you know, so it's, uh, yeah, and again, it, it makes the the whole thing a bit more organic because it's one take and absolutely. That's one of the things I was gonna say about torn arteries and listening to it. I wasn't sure if y'all tempo mapped or what, but when you don't do the click, uh, it's sometimes where it it assists the most is when you overly tempo map something, the transitions get a little weird, but then when you take that mm -hmm. out of it, the transitions have a little bit more breath and, and they flow into each other a little more naturally. And I would mm -hmm. say that torn arteries definitely has that. If y'all are dropping down, down, doing some down tempo stuff, which I feel like there's actually a pretty good bit of it on this record. Like you, if y'all yeah, yeah. are blazing into it for a second and then you kind of, uh, float into it a little bit more than it just being this sort of super angular, you know, yeah, cut and dry, yeah, cut yeah. and paste thing. But then again, Absolutely. that goes back to like what you're saying. If it's if it's more of a single take in between some of those parts, you're going to get some of that. And to me, I think that's what heavy music kind of needs. You know, there aren't many bands that do it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, th I like to think there's a um, there's an under kind of more of an underground swell of bands that are, you know, trying to move away from that kind of super process click track right obsessed with being perfect mm -hmm. thing and i i think you know i think it's i really think it's about time again there's there's a lot of music that i really like that is super techy super perfect sure. you know all that kind of stuff i do like that but generally uh, you know there's only so much i can listen to of that because i because i think there is not as much life to it and i think right maybe it's a you know maybe it's your ears maybe it's your brain it just i think it switches off quicker when it's just when there's no dynamics when there's no as you were saying like that kind of mm -hmm. you know that natural flow i think yeah i think naturally um humans re respond better to you know to things like like live music i think that's why people still love live music and will always Absolutely. love live music is because it's 
you know, it's it's that energy. It's that you know that you can't really replicate on a on any CD, no matter how good you are. Totally. Again, because I'm relatively young, especially compared to to those guys, and to be able to soak the, that kind of vibe up from them, that old school no click vibe, you know, no triggers, just you know, awesome. kind of keeping it as natural as possible. It's it's really, really, it's really cool. Um, I'm I'm glad that I've had that experience. Absolutely, man. You know, it was funny. I was going to mention it because I didn't know that that y'all did it without click tracks. And uh, one of the only other times that I spoke to somebody that played in like heavier, faster music, uh, the uh, I spoke to the drummer Isaac Falk. He plays in this band, uh, Blood Incantation, and uh, they re- oh, yeah. they recorded like it's got some pretty burning stuff on it, relative. Uh, and they recorded that no click tracks to tape. Wow. <laughs> yeah, dude. So they were really trying to go old school. And he was telling me the process of like going through that. And he was like, dude, it was tough. And I was like, I guarantee it was That's tough. That's pressure. Man. Yes. Yeah, man. Because, well, like with tape, you haven't got that. I mean, you can only do a certain amount of takes, right? And if, yeah. if you do mess up, then trying to edit things together is. Oh, that's a, I mean, ba- I mean, back in the day, that's that's all anybody had. But I nowadays, know. you get you get so used to just being at. Oh, let's just do another one, you know? Right, <laughs> or like, exactly. Let's just drop in halfway through, and I'll you know I'll do the second bit. So, God, yeah, that's <laughs> respect, respect, man. Yeah, Absolutely. I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> yeah, it's funny too because I spoke to uh, what I when I've spoken, I've talked talked to Ash Pearson a couple times on the podcast, and he's a big Frank Zappa guy. And yeah, one of the yeah. things that I I like to talk to him about as well is just like I listen to the One Size Fits All record, and uh, the first song I believe on the second side is uh, Florentine Pogan is the name of it, and it's I swear it's like the most amazing <laughs> Zappa song I've ever heard. But to think about like going into a studio session and knowing that you're recording to tape uh, to get that stuff like. That is a whole different level of pressure, man. Yeah, yeah. For me, absolutely. we've never had my bands. We've never had the budgets to where we could really like go in and just have a, a laxed time. It's always like looking at the clock. Yeah, you've got like three days, and you have to do as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, I'm recording drums in a day, and it's like. Uh, yeah, I, man. So oh. for me, I've got to. I kind of have to do the click tracks because I'm likely gonna. I I rarely fuck up the same spot in two takes. You know, so if I can get two <laughs> solid takes, I can A, B the two of them and get something, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and it just expedites it. So it's the way mm, it goes. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And again, it's it's I think, you know, because I'm sure you're the same. I practice to a click track or a metronome, not necessarily a click track, but I practice to a metronome all the time, yeah. like, especially when same I'm doing here. kind of exercises and rudiments, parallel, of course, you know, a- anything you can think of. But I think that's really essential. And I think being able to play to a click is also essential, but yeah. not being able to play without a click is, I, th- I I think, again, this is all personal opinion. It's, it's a problem. I think you should be able to play without a click as well. I yeah. think, you know, you shouldn't just be able to have to rely on that click a hundred percent. And if you don't have it, you're completely lost. I think for sure having a kind of a nice balance of the two where you're comfortable with a click, but also, you know, you can go off and go crazy and, and you know, and, and still keep time, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Uh, yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's just that's my opinion on that stuff. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, I was going to uh, make note of two of the more uh, funny song titles on this upcoming record. Uh, uh, Psycho Pomp and Circumstance is really good. As is uh, Eleanor Rigor Mortis is, is especially good. A nod to the Beatles. Very good with yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. How much of the carcass stuff is tongue in cheek? Because, I mean, like even the the Torn Arteries uh, record cover with the peppers, a heart made of peppers, for instance. Uh, and I know I got a couple yeah. of the guys are vegetarians, I guess. But <laughs> yeah. uh, some of it does seem to be like a little tongue in cheek. And I can never tell if like lyrically it's that way or is it just – uh, does it manifest itself primarily within the song titles? You know, it's de- I think a lot of it is definitely tongue in cheek. There is, I mean, and I, I guess it's death metal at the end of the day. And you know, <laughs> I think anybody who takes death metal in- super seriously just doesn't really understand death metal. You know, I think, <laughs> right. I think it's it's you know across the board it's tongue in cheek. You know, even Cannibal Corpse. Let's be honest. You know, oh, they're not, totally. They're yeah, not, right. They're not going out and killing people. It's all you know. It's all an act. <laughs> but um yeah so in, and i think like jeff's jeff's thing is kind of is because he's in charge of the um lyrics of course and he's also in charge of song titles and artwork especially artworks his thing 
Yeah, just kind of, he likes to kind of wind people up, you know, kind of piss people off as much <laughs> as much as he can. Because <laughs> yeah. I know back in the eighties, he was, you know, he was kind of part of that anarcho punk movement. He, you know, he was like, you know, protests and all kinds of stuff. Uh-huh. He had dreadlocks and all that thing. And I think there's there's a lot of that still left in him. That kind of like, you know, fuck the man, fuck the system kind sure. of thing. And I think a lot of his stuff is he kind of tries to make quite strong points but he covers it up with humor and kind of, you okay. know, so, so a lot of it, I, he never tells me what any of the lyrics are about. Like I've tried to, I've tried to ask, you know, I'll be like, Oh, is this song about this? And he'll be like, Oh, figure it out for yourself. You know, so <laughs> okay. it's, uh, he never really gives too much away, but he's, you know, he's, he's constantly, constantly trying to wind people up and he constantly tells jokes in, in person, in real life. He's a, he's, he never takes anything really seriously. So it's, Again, I th- I think a lot of it is just his personality. He's just kind of a yeah. He just he just likes to piss people off and and try and make as many people laugh and himself laugh as he can. So, yeah, right. And I think that was the that was the thing with the artwork too. Like, um, he was totally in charge of that. He told us the idea, and me and Bill were like, Ooh, we can't really imagine that. <laughs> he basically said, you know, or maybe a, a body part made out of vegetables, and we were like. Okay, uh, let's let's see how that goes. And then uh, he found this guy who who did it, and then we heard nothing. And then this guy just sent back. It's it is it's a sculpture. Like it's there's no um, again there's no trickery there. There's no yeah. CGI or anything. It is literally just a picture of a of a sculpture. And all uh, me and Bill were just blown away. We were like, wow, this is because from a distance it just looks like a heart, and you're a right. bit like, ugh, that uh-huh. sucks. And then when when you get closer, it's oh, I, peppers. That's, yeah, that's yeah, exactly. And it's it's kind of like, oh, that's actually quite impressive that someone's managed to, you know, do all this. So, totally. But we knew when we saw it because of the colors, you know, it's lots of white and it's lots of bright colors and stuff. We knew people were going to be pissed off, right? Especially metal, especially metal people. It's not black enough, bros. No, exactly, dude. And uh, and yeah, sure enough, Jeff was like, "Good. I hope as many people are as pissed off as they can." Be. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, Amazing. So yeah, that so there is a lot of. There is a lot of kind of tongue in cheek, um, kind of yeah. It's just kind of silly humor Ch- again, just trying to wind people up and trying right. to kind of, you know, trying to keep them guessing. And yeah, so again, even I didn't know what the songs are about. So. That's amazing. Well, if you don't, <laughs> then I certainly wouldn't. Um, well, I was uh, I was in going back and sort of listening to uh, some of the the older Carcass stuff and more modern stuff, and I've been kind of trying to not that I like play blast beats but it's been something i always was kind of like if i wanted to do do it i could just do it and then i realized it's definitely harder than i expected (laughs) but uh like i was watching for instance like Derek roddy and he was kind of of the opinion that like if you want to play fast start fast uh but then conversely like someone like yourself i've heard you say like actually play it slow and kind of get a grip on what it is slow and uh, I've spoken to, like, I spoke to drummer Psychroptic, and I think he was more in the Derek Roddy school where he just started fast yep. and then pushed his threshold. Mm-hmm. And then he told me, he's like, man, between, like, 120, sort of mid-tempo stuff, 120 to, like, 160, whatever that is for him, he's like, that shit is hard. <laughs> you know? And yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been going through a phase where I kind of just built a, a little MIDI template of going from 120 to 175, I think, like that. Mm. I don't know exactly how many measures per, and it, it, it goes in increments of five BPMs. And so oh, I'll cool. just kind okay. of go through it. But what I found was that I, I, was, I was doing, you know, trying to play 16th notes through all of it and maybe taking a break uh, doing singles. Uh, on each foot, yeah. you know, breaking it up. But I, I kept burning out by the time I got to about 140, 145, because I'd been playing 16th notes the whole time. So then, yeah. then it's an endurance issue. And then I was like thinking about Derek's kind of idea about it. And I was like, well, you know, I'm not even getting to 150 because I'm burning myself out. Like I should at least start yeah. there so I can actually start hearing it. And then get up to, and then, yeah. And yeah, then yeah. I could always yeah. go back. So I think part of what you say and part of what he says I, I i've been actually splitting the difference and trying to do both yeah absolutely and i think that's actually been helping me you know yeah that's i think as you know as much as anybody every drummer is so different and totally. um something that works i mean and obviously Derek roddy and dave haley from psychopathic are just unbelievably incredible Monsters. drummers so <laughs> uh, yeah it's just insane um so obviously i would never go against what they say because you know that whatever they're doing is working do you know (laughs) unbelievably well much better than i could ever do but (laughs) all the stuff that 
I, I kind of tell people is is um, it's stuff that's worked for me. It's the, it's the kind of it's the way I found my way to do stuff. Mm. And um, and yeah, just just starting slow was always, always the thing that worked for me. I think um, my wife's a teacher and she's she's told me that, you know, people learn in very different ways. And I think my way of, of figuring stuff out is really slowing stuff down and then gradually building it back up again to the to the point that it needs to be and I, I know i know for a fact there's some guys like um this guy called james stewart he plays for decapitated invader now uh-huh is uh there's a couple of other guys i know as well and they are they're those kind of dudes they just go straight in straight and they're in. just like yeah they were just like well yeah you know i wanted to blast beat so i just started blasting wow and i was like oh shit like <laughs> and they were like yeah yeah you know i just figured i just figured out i just you know i just had to learn it so i just you know just went straight in and was just like right okay so blast beats from day one you know as, as fast as i can and then i'll just you know slowly build up the you know the the endurance over time but right you know they didn't they, they weren't like start slow and then build it up it was just like as fast as i can and then go faster and then go faster and faster and faster so and faster and faster and yeah, and then I've I've met other guys who are the same as me who who really had to slow it down and understand exactly what you know each each movement was, what you know what my, the body was trying to do, and um, and yeah, I I I assume it's just it's 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 that whole thing of like everybody learns different, and I think for me that just worked, and I, and I remember when I was especially when I was a teenager trying to do more like the Derek Roddy thing, like just kind of you know because I remember I used to work in a drum shop and. Um, there was always Buddy Rich on, of course. Yeah. Um, and one of the guys at the drum shop said, you know, because uh, he knew I was into metal and I was trying to go fast. And he was saying, oh, yeah, Buddy Rich. Uh, there was this thing Buddy Rich used to say, like, if you do, like, bursts of really fast, that will help you build your speed up. Like, you know, just kind of play moderate tempo and then every now and again just do as fast as you can and then, you know, just pull it back again and, and keep doing that incrementally. Mm. And I was like, well, if Buddy Rich says it, then that must Shit. be, you know, it must, it must be <laughs> how it worked. And then I tried that for like, I remember for months and it just, I just didn't get anywhere. And I remember just being, just being really frustrated. Like, shit, man, if Buddy Rich says it I, and I can't do it, like, what the fuck is wrong with me? <laughs> totally. So, uh, <laughs> yes. And I think just over the years, I found, I found that this way, that way was the best. And even now, like I still, when I'm doing like, especially if I'm getting ready to, to play shows or whatever. I still start at 120. Like if I'm doing bass drum stuff, I'll start at 120. Mm -hmm. I'll do 16th notes at 120 with a basic groove, and I'll play that for at least a minute or so, yeah. and then I'll move up to 130, 140, 150, 160. 10 minutes um, or 10 BPM. Yeah, minutes. and then I and then I just go up um, until, as you say, almost until I can't go any faster or I can't go anymore, and my legs are like ah. <laughs> right. But I almost find like doing that starting slower and then gradually moving up has helped my endurance as much as anything and i think especially you know when you're playing headline sets especially with like carcass and stuff it's an hour and a half i've Ooh. really noticed those kind of exercises really help instead of just playing the set you know it's like because if i just practice the songs then you know that's great and obviously i do practice the songs as well as much as i can but just practicing the songs if there's anything in that day that's that's fucked me up like i've had a you know it's a long travel day i haven't had any sleep or i haven't really eaten or i'm a little bit hung over you know i haven't got that buffer to kind of help me with the endurance if you know what i mean uh -huh. so doing these really long i mean it's super long and really boring all these these exercises i do but oh, I know. doing the, the <laughs> as, as i'm sure yeah as you were just saying yeah you've uh, you're experiencing it as well but um it it's kind of it's for me it's a kind of necessity I, I feel like i don't think i can perform as well as i can especially on an endurance level if i don't do these kind of exercises from really slow to as fast as i can go and it's just again i think it's just it's just the way the way that works for me and I, again i wouldn't necessarily say it works for everybody but yeah it's, I'm, I'm gonna shout from the rooftops that it worked for me because it's because it has <laughs> right <laughs> so yeah one of but the... yeah Derek Roddy's the king so you know I know right <laughs> I can't uh, take away from him either <laughs> I know right uh one of your guests on your podcast uh Mar Martin uh the guy does the bass drum master oh course. Martin Ivanovich yeah yeah, yeah 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 I actually so I, I actually purchased that and I've been going through some of that he's got some some like really good warm-up stuff and not to give too much away oh, cool. of it but he does uh I liked his 
uh, sort of emphasis on developing your hip flexors and sort of getting mm. a balance between your hip flexors and your ankle movement and whether you use swivel or you're a little more heel up or even a little more heel down, kind of mm. finding the different groups that work in conjunction with, with each other at different tempos. Wow. That's a whole nother level. <laughs> wow. That's what I kind of read into it because that's what I've yeah. been struggling with because what works for me at 120 form-wise doesn't work at 167, yeah. you know, 170. Yeah. So I'm, I'm having to be more conscious of how this stuff is working together to try to get there. That's what I Which took from. Which muscles and posture yes. and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess that's a whole other other side of it. That, And I think Martin is – He's he's really really hot on all that muscle stuff and like yeah. why why things do the things they do at certain tempos and you know correct. Whereas I think a lot of drum teachers are just like just keep going, man. Keep going, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. very analytical, Martin Martin. Is, yeah, yeah sure. which is yeah, and that, it's it's to, it's such a big part of it, isn't it? Posture and how you sit and yeah. which part of the pedals you use, which part of your legs you use at certain tempos, and uh, it's such a minefield, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it is. But, you know, to your point, though, because everybody's different, it's a, it's a little tough not doing it in person and having someone be like, OK, move this a little bit this way. It takes so much experimentation and there's so many variables mm. between like if you have a big dumb clown foot like I have <laughs> and you're playing a shorter <laughs> pedal, which I've always played. And then the spring <laughs> tension is some way and then the beaters at a particular angle. And then like yeah. there's all these variables and it's just it's a lot to try to figure out how to get get you there some people stumble into it i guess you know some people just blast mm, through the mm, pain definitely. and get get there yeah, yeah, yeah. everybody's like you said has different ways of getting there but man yeah the, mm. the double bass thing is and it's one of the reasons why i love talking to people because it's always been kind of my achilles heel it's been such a pain <laughs> in the ass to develop for me like and just be really fluent like my hands are you know mm, it's yeah, just yeah. it's been a bitch yeah well and quite honestly it is that i was telling someone recently about it it's it's the thing that takes by far the most uh, maintenance for me is is totally. double bass. Like, I mean, I may, I don't, I don't know if it's because your hands, you just you use them all the time. That's exactly what it is. You have fine motor skills with your hands, not with your toes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, know? you don't just, you know, you don't just tap dance all day. Right. I, I mean, they would be good at double bass. I guess. I know, they, they, <laughs> you would have thought, wouldn't you? <laughs> but. Yeah, and I th and just you know, just playing drums uh, in any style, you use your hands a lot. You know, right. no matter what kind of style you play. And I think, whereas your feet are, you know, if you're playing relatively basic music, your feet are doing r relatively basic things. It's mm -hmm. only really in certain styles of music, and metal is one of those where your feet are like, oh, hang on, we got to do as much as the hands. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's, you know, so it's it's a real oh man, it's it's such a nightmare trying to you know trying to maintain it and you know firstly get to the point that you want to get to and then to maintain that as well as nightmare. oh it sucks i know <laughs> i know i think i was i was talking to my buddy lev weinstein he's a great drummer plays a lot of extreme stuff and he was saying he's like it's as if the 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 brain for his feet is dumber than the brain for his hands and i was like that, that's <laughs> yeah, that's definitely. one way of putting it as well <laughs> yeah definitely it's like it's like, it's like basic stuff you know like a, st a super simple sticking pattern that you could do with your hands and then oh, you God. try it on your feet and you can't you, it's like no. just even you can't even get it right once no. <laughs> and your hands are like come on guys we got this and then you're, no, your feet are like no we have not got this <laughs> right i know it really is crazy it really it really really is man <laughs> Uh, well, we, yeah. you talked about some of the, and we've both talked about some of the guys out there and just players in general that, that, that we dig, uh, there's some guys that I, that I certainly have been digging on in, in this kind of heavier extreme style. You, of course, uh, as well as, you know, we spoke about Ash Pearson earlier and I definitely yeah, like sick, watching man. like Sebastian Lancer and, uh, oh, Alex Rudinger <laughs> and of course oh, incredible the fucking well. ultimate drum savage and Eloy Casagrande. Jesus. Oh God. The guy's yeah, a just... monster. Oh man, he may. He, I don't know whether I want to quit or practice when I when I, I hear when you. I watch him play. It's, it's it's kind of it's, it's a lot. It's happiness and depression all at the same simultaneously. Time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so outrageous, man. <laughs> oh god, I know it's wild watching him and uh, that. You know, it's funny too because there's one video in particular where he's playing. I don't know if it's one of the Slipknot covers where he's just fucking destroying that as well. But I think and he's playing. <laughs> yeah. so I forget what the maybe it's 180 something like that and he was saying that he, he wasn't using triggers on it and he i was watching his feet he has a really solid i mean everything he does with, is with brute force you know yeah and, yeah, yeah uh, but he was good swivel like technique with with what he was mm. doing 
But uh, as far as triggers go, I like talking to, to drummers about those as well because there seems to be a little bit of confusion about them. People think that like they'll create notes that you haven't played or, you know, <laughs> yeah. like if you have two bass drums, I suppose if your left foot, for instance, is a little bit weaker than your right with volume, you could, mm. tr you could maybe level that trigger up a little bit higher, I suppose. And if not, yeah, then you yeah. got, what are you going to have somebody riding a fader on your left foot? That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I don't, exactly. <laughs> I don't know how much triggers can really cover up if you don't have your fundamentals together is what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. I I do find it amazing as well that in again in twenty twenty one, especially like other drummers aren't even aware of you know triggers existing. It's it's quite it's quite. I mean, I think it's such a common thing in metal that you know I think to me it just blows my mind that some drummers have never even heard like, of triggering what? a bass drum. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, you've never heard of bass drum triggers? Right. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, I think again, and I, until Carcass, I use triggers pretty much exclusively and i still like i do session work and stuff and i have to use triggers and there's it's it's a total different discipline i i find it's like um uh and again when i joined carcass being so used to playing triggers um i i was absolutely completely unconscious of my dynamics my bass drum dynamics so uh -huh. my dynamics were kind of all over the place you know like in the slower stuff i was like oh you know hitting Step really in. hard yeah, yeah yeah and then it would go uh and then it would get, get kick into a faster thing and i'd just be da, 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 you know just right exactly it. yeah and it took it definitely took me a good couple of years i would say of playing you know touring a lot to to really kind of i definitely shifted my technique so that i was kind of pulling back on the slower stuff and then hitting harder on the faster stuff. So I was ah. kind of meeting, in the, you know, meeting in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, to I, I, again, talking about posture and muscles, I was definitely using a different posture and stuff than I was ever using with triggers. Cause triggers is again, they, de they don't create extra notes and it's not right. cheating by any, like in a lot of ways you have to be almost more accurate because you can hear every tiny little, any, anytime you're out, you can hear it a lot almost more than you can with a microphone but yeah the again the issue the issue for me was dynamics it's like because as you say if your left foot is super weak it doesn't really matter because the trigger is just gonna go Duh! anyway yeah <laughs> so yeah. it's gonna be a hundred percent all the time so and that was that was my biggest learning curve was like shit man like I, my feet are all over the place and i didn't even know like just from a dynamics wow. point like i was yeah. you know i was kind of i was i was relatively happy with how tight it was but you know, removing that kind of um, that consistent dynamic, especially the sound of it as well, like hearing it in the monitors. I yes. just got so used to that, just constant. Da, 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 da. Right. You know, that the minute I had I didn't have that as a kind of safety mechanism, it, it really messed me up, especially for again, for a couple of a good couple of years. I was I was really trying to figure out the best way to, you know, I changed my pedal settings and everything too to try and, you know, basically get more power across the board. Mm -hmm. Um but it's again, and again, and that's why I, I I honestly feel it's a it's a different discipline. Like with with triggers, you can kind of sit back more. You don't have to worry about dynamics. It's it's literally just about how tight you can make it. Right. Um. Whereas with the microphone, you've got that whole other aspect, which is Everything. like you know, you, it needs to in the fast bits, you need to hear it. You know, it doesn't. It can't just be you know just tapping away. And then if you're playing slow stuff, you can't hit super hard either because then it's just going to destroy the fast stuff that you play. So it's yeah, again, so again, double bass drums, dude. Minefield. <laughs> 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 Fucking sucks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so true, man. Uh, so I'm at least glad that I'm starting out, I guess, without them. So I'm more mm. conscious about the dynamic aspect of it. Absolutely. Uh, and Absolutely. no, because I, I mean, it's hard not to be conscious of it when you can hear it like that. You know? Yeah, absolutely, and I th so I think it is a good way to start start that way. Definitely, and I think I think again, like I wish I'd kind of, I mean, I I probably had a a year or two, maybe two years of playing double bass before I started playing with triggers, but you know, I immediately jumped into playing with bands, and uh, you know, especially when I was a teenager, all the bands were playing with triggers, so it right. was straight away I was I was kind of learning and practicing with triggers, and and so yeah absolutely man i wish i'd kind of gone the other way and you know because i think it's easier to go from microphones to triggers than it is the other way it, at least I would for think me so. like yeah again like because dynamics is such a big thing like it's like just think about dynamics on your hands like learning Completely. dynamics on your hands it's like you know if you'd never learned how to play dynamics on your hands before and someone's like right 
Here you go. You've got to learn dynamics for a, you know, for a gig. You've got to learn. You don't know what dynamics are, and now you have to learn them. <laughs> yeah. Get your jazz hands together, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you've you got two weeks. You know, so it's like, not going to happen. Yeah. Versus, you know, triggers, I think is, again, I've got no problem with triggers, but that was, that was a big thing for me was just not realizing that my, my dynamics were just non-existent. <laughs> totally. With, with, uh, with setup, man, I noticed that you generally play your bass drum kind of at one o'clock. You're a right-handed player. So uh, yep. in accordance with sort of where you're sitting straight at the one o'clock. Uh, I too started doing that after I took a lesson with Ken Shock, who uh, played with Candiria and is uh, just a oh, killer yeah. drummer. Sick drummer. Yeah, yeah. he's so badass. Uh, and he, it was it was interesting taking it with him because he was all about ergonomics and setup and everything else. And mm. when I interviewed him, I was joking with him because I was thinking we were gonna do chops and I was he was gonna show me grooves and it was none of that. <laughs> he just like broke my drum set down and then like set it back wow. up and had some suggestions about this and that and the other, which was really interesting and some some bad habits that I had. Wow. And uh, one of his suggestions was was uh, moving the bass drum more uh, to think of it as if there was a second bass drum. And if so, your right bass drum would be pointed at the one o'clock. Yeah. So you'd yeah. have 11 o'clock and one o'clock, more or less. Yeah, absolutely. You know? yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. I've done it ever since then. And I was like, I can't believe I ever played my bass drum pointed straight. Really? Wow. So yeah. it's made a huge difference for you. Absolutely. It's helped wow, with my double bass cool. because... I was orienting myself, my bass drum forward, and then my left foot was over here, and I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't facing straight, so my posture was fucked up. And he, yeah, he brought that. That up. makes sense. Yeah. Again, these are all again going back to what you were saying about Martin. Like these are things that you don't necessarily think about, right? Just little things like how you position yourself on the kit can make such a difference with how you perform. Totally. Yeah. That's yeah. That's cool. <laughs> wow. I'm glad. I'm glad it helped, man. I'm glad. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, as far as like some of the old school guys that have contributed to this, I mean, I, I always kind of look at the Gene Hoaglands and Sean Reinerts, yeah. and it's kind of hard not to look at those those death records. And even obviously, uh, you know, Sean's work with Cynic and whatnot. But like, mm -hmm. who do you hear? And, and even from speaking of like John Longstreth, you know, they cannot, they'll always point to like, you know, I guess early Napalm Death stuff and maybe just the grindy, crazy white noise yeah, version yeah. of what that was. <laughs> and then sort yeah. of how like the, the guys like Sean and Gene kind of came along and with those concepts sort of executed them in a different way. But who do you kind Absolutely, of yeah. see as the sort of the, 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 the forefathers of some of this stuff? Yeah, well, a hundred percent, Gene. Like I've been a, I, I first heard Gene with Strapping Young Lad when I was a teenager, I guess, and, and yeah. that just, I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> yeah. Gene's so bad. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, up until that point, I'd heard kind of, you know, Iron Maiden and stuff, and kind of, you know, Metallica probably, but, you know, and then when I heard that drumming, I was like, oh my god, like yeah. I didn't know you could you could play like that, and um, yeah, so obviously he's he's big influence on me, but I think. Yeah, you're definitely right. There was there's a lot of that music, you know, Carcass, Napalm Death, um, sure, totally from the um, from the kind of eighties, late eighties and stuff. But it's so noisy and it's so kind of disjointed and like, ah, and it's I, I I honestly feel I like, and as me and Bill and Jeff have talked about this as well. We we feel like uh, Pete Sandoval from you know Morbid Angel and sure. Terrorizer. He was kind of one of the first guys to really kind of be super tight in that kind of you know in that kind of super extreme right kind of grind corey death metal world yep and i think and for me as well like he's he's he was well again when i first heard morbid angel i was like shit this is this is the tightest kind of right. extreme drumming that i've ever heard and it's yeah so he's he's a really 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 big one for me um and again it's it's nice to hear that bill and jeff consider him you know one of those kind of early and again, Bill and Jeff hugely respect Gene as well for for being because he's been around forever, forever. <laughs> yeah, literally, like they they toured back in the day with uh, it, was, it was Dark Angel he was with, wasn't he? Um, and yeah. Carcass and uh, I think Carcass and Dark Angel toured together, or at least they knew of each other. You know, yeah, they yeah. were aware of each other. And uh, Donald Tardy too from Obituary. I mean, he's not absolutely so. You know, he's not crazy, gr gr blasty, grindy, but just. Oh, so solid man like unbelievably solid and like his his ideas are so musical and mm -hmm. creative and yeah like he's again absolutely one of the forefathers and um 
forefathers. That sounds really yeah. Uh, he probably <laughs> wouldn't. Want, they they probably don't want to be talked yeah, about like been that. Around Makes them sound while, really old. Yeah, okay. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys, making them feel old. We could say grandfather. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's any better. I'd take forefathers <laughs> over grandfathers. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, one of the originators. There we yeah, go. There we go. There we go. There we go. But yeah, so definitely Pete Sandoval, Donald Tardy, Gene. Um, and uh, yeah, I think those, for me, those are the guys that kind of, in my mind, kind of solidified where we're at now. You know, they, they were kind of the original guys that kind of, you know, I guess showed the world blast beats, really. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Maybe not Donald, obviously, but yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Right on, man. Well, with your dr- podcast, I didn't even say it, but the Extreme Drummers podcast. Uh, yeah. I feel like you started doing that probably in 2020, no? Because I think Ash was your first, uh, your first guest, yeah, right? Man. Yeah, yeah, and I think I mentioned to you, you were one of the uh, your podcast was one of the inspirations for me to go for it. So it's oh, uh, nice. Yeah, so thank you, thank oh, you for man. the inspiration. Absolutely. But uh, yeah, man, it was it was just kind of uh, again, it was the world was on lockdown. Yep. <laughs> and we weren't touring, and I just thought it was kind of it would be it would be interesting to see if uh, firstly anybody cared, you know, about uh, ex- a couple of extreme drummers talking to each other. Um, but again, I, I was aware of your podcast and I was like, oh, cool. You know, he, he speaks to, you know, some drummers that most, a lot of people wouldn't necessarily interview, you know, you, you right. know especially like I, I first was aware of you when you interviewed Ben Collar and, um, mm-hmm. Nick Yakushin as well. Sure. And I, I love and those I guys like, as well. Yeah. Yeah, dude. I was like, fuck, nobody interviews these guys. This is amazing. And then, you know, so I thought. Oh, maybe I could, you know, maybe I could try something where I interviewed some, you know, some of my friends mm-hmm. and who are who don't necessarily get interviewed so much. For sure. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just it was just a, a a fun thing and kind of I had nothing else to do in lockdown and I I am hoping to bring it back. It's just uh, I've recently got my garage converted and ever since I got the garage converted, I've had crazy amounts of session work and teaching stuff and it's well, you know what it's like. Yeah, I've got two kids as well. Yeah. It's it's just kind of. <laughs> squeezing it all in has been really tough but um uh, yeah i'm hoping to get it back as soon as i can but yeah nice. as as you know it's just it's good fun isn't it like chatting yeah. to people get nerdy about drums and <laughs> <laughs> yeah well let me ask you yeah, this man. what uh in interviewing i guess uh, specifically drummers that have geared themselves towards the more extreme side of music is there any particularly consistent personality type? Because generally speaking, drummers tend to be kind of an anxious lot, chewing their fingernails, you know, <laughs> pacing around, beating on the walls, beating on this. Every drummer Can't says they still. were beaten yeah. on shit when they were kids. You know, it's just like <laughs> yeah. high energy, kind of fairly neurotic. All of those personality types seem to be funneled into drumming in my experience. So I don't know if extreme drumming is that person, all of those personality traits like notched up a tad or is everybody just like cool and like at ease with themselves? I think again, like so far, I've only really spoken to kind of my friends and people I've toured with before. So I think moving forward, you know, I'm going to run out of people that I actually know personally. So I think it'll be interesting to see when I move out of my friendship circle, what, what, you know, what those kind of drummers are like, but, <laughs> but no, I think generally, yeah, you're right. I think, you know, most, most people, are ch- and I think you, you've probably found the same. Like, I think most drummers, even if you play different music, you have, you know, a connection. It's drums at the end of the day is, is the connection, isn't it? And I think, sure. as you say, drum, drummers are always a little bit kind of can't sit still. And my wife always says that just fucking sit down, sit still. And I'm like, Oh, I've got to do something. <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah i think that the extreme the extreme metal drummers thing is there's definitely i think maybe a, a bit more obsessive you know and a little bit more kind of uh, all of us at some point were willing to sit down with a metronome for hours and play yeah there's a lot i think there's a there's a there's a lot of drummers that just can't relate to that and and i think maybe that's the kind of linking factor is that weird obsessive maybe slightly autistic thing for sure i know it always it it certainly crossed my mind (laughs) slightly on the spectrum yeah absolutely dude where you can just sit with a metronome for hours doing the same thing and you know in your head you're bored but you still do it anyway it's kind of yeah it's very it's very very strange so i think yeah there's definitely some there's definitely that some parallels there but it's it's funny because there's some people because like you know crim um, uh huh. Yeah. He's uh he's super fitness guy. You know, like doesn't gets up super early. Does loads of fitness and 
doesn't really, uh, you know, doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, doesn't do anything. And then, oh my God, what does he do with himself? Just works out and plays <laughs> drums. That's insane. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> Just hearing you say that makes me want to drink a beer. I know, I know. I know. It makes me want to go to bed late. Just think. About it. But, and you know, like as, again, he's a good friend of mine, and I love him. But I, you know, I can't, I can't relate to that personality type. Like, and then after him, I spoke to Alan from Black Dahlia, who is, who is yeah. very much like me. You know, super chilled, likes to drink, likes to have a smoke. You know, just kind of goes to bed too late, doesn't get enough sleep. You know, that kind right. of thing. So it's, yeah. but again, you know, there's that parallel of still sat down with a metronome and you know just fucking played blast beats for two hours straight with a metro you know so it's even though there's different personalities there is that kind of common thread of of and i guess it's the obsession with metal i guess too i, I guess for that's, sure that's probably a thing because you know everybody who's who's e everybody who's ever tried to play double bass you know i think is probably doing it because they like metal on some, on right. some level. Yeah. I mean, again, there are other types of music that use double bass, but you know, metal is is mainly the one, isn't it? Really. Let's yeah. Be so. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so yeah, there is there's there is common threads, but there is definitely personality differences um, between, and I think, and the guy Martin as well, um, the guy you were talking about, he's similar to Krim. He's very yes. rigid, structured. You know, clearly he's very wakes. Up. Yeah, absolutely. I think again, yeah, you can tell by the way he teaches and you know all that stuff. And, you know, works out a lot and all that stuff. And again, I can't, I cannot relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. But uh, there are the parallels, but there's also lots of differences too. But everyone's cool. Everyone's right. cool, I think. Nice, man. Were you, uh, <laughs> were you good in school? Did you, in, did you enjoy school and or were you good in school? Um, yeah, I, I did well in school. I had, a, I had a good group of friends. I didn't love school. I, I loved, you know, I loved hanging out because we were like the music kids, the nerdy music kids who just like listened to Slayer and Metallica and nice. all the, you know, all the, all the popular kids just <laughs> hated us. It was, it was great. But yeah, so I didn't <laughs> like school and I, I did, I did well in school, but yeah, I, I wouldn't have said I was, you know, a great student or anything. I think I just kind of, I, I, I think I got quite lucky. I don't really know how I did it. <laughs> what age, but, what age did you start playing drums then? Um, I was around 10. I oh think wow! Ten or eleven, like drum yeah, set. So, yeah, yeah, I went straight to straight to because that's one thing in the states that a lot of Europeans are really jealous of is the the marching band stuff that that you guys. I don't know if I did that. Yeah, I was going to say I was I was curious because I, I don't know how big a thing it is, but from the outside it seems like it's quite a big thing. Yeah, the the marching thing is it is do most people have that option to kind of? Yeah, do I mean especially uh, in Southeast Louisiana and in New Orleans in that area where Mardi Gras happens, then all the yeah. marching bands take. Uh, uh, part in that that season that extravaganza so, cool. so there's an outlet for it you know it's not yeah. just like playing the football game uh and yeah. there's definitely that there's like collegiate level like drum corps mm. like you know drum marching bands crazy drum stick lines, trick stuff all that yeah, stick trick yeah. stuff yeah it gets that stuff gets pretty wild too so i, I did it in like high school uh and honestly i hated it and i, I was just oh, really like, i didn't like the actual act of of marching along and having to mm. play that same shit over and over and like the weather and like the we're playing snare the the straps were digging into my back i was like this kind of sucks and then i'd be looking <laughs> over at like the dude carrying the bass drum i'm like bro you are the man i'm not i don't want to carry a snare drum i'm not gonna carry a fucking bass drum no less god dude carrying a tuba i'm like fuck <laughs> so i didn't really like it i love watching them and i love uh nerding yeah, out yeah. on rudiments I, I i hung with some guys that were more from the drum core world and those guys get heavy, heavy, deep into that stuff. And you can always yeah, learn man. from them as well. But yeah, I kind of grew up with a little bit of that as well. So, yeah. And that's, again, like, I think for, for especially British people and, and a lot of Europeans, it's, we just don't have that culture, that kind of marching, marching band yeah. kind of culture. And, and, you know, I, I feel like you can see it a lot more in, in, um, uh, players from, from the States is kind of, it seems to be more of an awareness of kind of rudiments and kind of, you know, that kind of stuff. And I think it's just, yeah, it's really cool. Like from the outside, it's really cool. It's kind of just like, you know, there's, there's, a, there's almost like a bigger drum culture just because of that in, uh -huh. in the States than there is, than there is in Europe. So it's kind of, um, yeah. I, so the, the only way really you learn drums in the UK anyway is, is just by kind of wanting to learn drums and getting drum lessons and it's all drum set. Like, uh, right, right. 
everybody who I know from my age, younger and older, they all started on drum. Maybe on a snare drum, but it wasn't in a you know in a um, marching band way. It would have been you know like jazz brushes starting on jazz and just learning you know mm -hmm. a couple of rudiments here and there. But ninety percent of people, maybe more, it's just straight into drum set, which is you know which is cool because obviously that's the best one. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in my opinion, anyway, it's, uh, I think you know it's the most fun. But yeah, um, yeah, I think having that. I was always jealous and a lot of my drumming friends were quite jealous of that, you know, that whole marching band kind of, um, you know, uh, what culture you know, uh -huh. that, that happens in the States where you always have the option to kind of play drums and learn serious rudiment stuff and, you know, stickings and all that stuff, which, um, again, if I was a teenager, I probably would hate it because, you know, it's like when I was a teenager, I just wanted to smoke and get drunk and find women. Yeah, I still want to do that. <laughs> I just exactly. can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, not the lady part, yeah, but the I... smoking and drinking thing, I guess <laughs> yeah. I still do that. Okay, I, I take it back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In, in my head, I'm still 15, I think. Yeah. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, so probably in reality, I wouldn't have wanted to do it because, you know, I wouldn't have had the concentration to sit down and learn stickings and, you know, all that stuff. But, yeah. you know, as a as a more quote-unquote mature drummer right kind of, you know I, I wish i'd kind of had more access to that stuff but mm -hmm. yeah so I, I just went straight in with with drum set and it was you know learning basic rock beats and sure stuff and you know all that and i had a couple of friends and we kind of you know taught each other little things here and there and then i got to a point where no one could teach me double bass like there was no one in my area yeah and this was obviously before uh well, the internet was around, but, you know, there wasn't Google, there wasn't YouTube, and, you know, you remember those times. Sure. Um, but um, VHS so yeah, instructional kind of, videos, man. Yeah, dude, exactly. And then Hudson DVDs, that was yeah. a game changer. DCI instructional out. videos. Yeah, yeah. man. Oh, God, yeah. that, was, that literally changed my world when all that stuff started happening. Oh, but, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I just bought a double pedal and kind of, you know, just hoped for the best. And <laughs> Crazy. And that, so, yeah, so since I was probably around 13, I guess I've kind of taught myself. And then again with Hudson DVDs and, and then YouTube came along and yeah, I know. all that kind of stuff. So it's, yeah, so it's relatively easy to teach yourself, I guess, these days in a lot of ways. But, um, but yeah, traditionally I learned how to read and, you know, all that, all that stuff. But, um, nice. Yeah, didn't love it. So I just kind of moved on to Metallica. <laughs> I know, I know. It's far more fun. It's far more yeah. fun. Oh, God, man. <laughs> right on. Well, I guess uh, with the record coming out in September, are there any tentative dates or dates that are maybe even on the books that y'all haven't announced yet for any tours? Are you coming to the States? Uh, what's what's going on? Well, we have, in theory, we have a tour. Uh, when does it start? October, I think. And that's UK and Europe. And that's with um, Behemoth nice. and Arch Enemy. But we're not sure if it's going to go ahead. It's still kind of we're still being talked because of you know well, because of the state of this crazy crazy world. I mean, the UK is fine right now. Like the UK, we've kind of opened up pretty much, and shows are happening again, and it seems to be going well. But in mainland Europe, in every single country, there's different restrictions. Like you know, we could go to I, can't, I think Holland and Belgium and Germany, and it would be fine. But then the minute you hop over to France. They've got restrictions, you know, you can't play more than 100 people in one area. And then ah. you go to Spain and it's different restrictions. And then you go to another place. So Ugh. it's just not really feasible to do a tour because, you know, every place you go, there is different restrictions, which, you know, so it's so we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully it's, it goes ahead. But, you know, at this point, we're, we're not sure. Um, and we're just we're just kind of hoping that that happens because that's right after the album release. So that would be really, really sick. If we, and we haven't toured in two years. So. Right. So that would be nice. But um, we're hoping, we're, I can't announce anything yet, but yep. we're hoping and planning to come to the States next year. Again, I can't say anything, unfortunately, officially sure. yet, but we will definitely be in the States next year as long as we're allowed in with yeah. COVID and all this crazy shit I going know. on. Oh my so, God. But yeah, so we'll definitely be definitely be over next year at least once, if not twice. So uh, Awesome, awesome. Yeah, if y'all are nearby yeah, uh, coming through here or anywhere nearby, I'll have to come catch up with y'all, man, because to this day, I have not seen Carcass live, so... 
uh this oh, would be well, my uh my debut be more than welcome man be yeah more than welcome just yeah well we'll, we'll keep it up when the when i'm allowed to announce the dates then <laughs> yeah. we can uh yeah we can figure something out that'd be sweet <laughs> excellent right on well dan it was fun talking to you man i appreciate the time uh good luck with all of the the projects tracking recording more podcast episodes for you possibly uh and uh hopefully coming through and and playing live again i'm ready to rock the fuck out already this is bullshit Oh, no, man. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. I mean, I love my kids and wife, but, you know, I think they want me to leave as much as I want to leave. I bet so. they do. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, you're never at home this long. This sucks. <laughs> yeah, too much. Go blow some steam <laughs> off, you asshole. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. But no, thank you, man. Thanks for having me. It's been, uh, it's been a pleasure, and it's been really good fun. Thank you. Yeah, man. All right, everybody, hope y'all enjoyed the chat. Thanks to Dan for being a good dance partner with the Gabin and all. This new Carcass record smokes. I'm glad they put it out. Some killer drumming, killer riffing, all around goodness. We'll catch y'all on the next one. Crash, bang, boom.